Hi, this is J.P. Morgan and Lars Lindstrom. We're here with Trends from the Trenches. So Lars, how have you been the last month? Oh man, I've been so good. Are you engaged? I am engaged. Did, I, did everyone know that, that Lars is engaged? I think this is news. I think the, it is news. To the internet world. It's not news to me, but it's news to the internet world. Yeah. Engaged, going to be married sometime in April. May. May. May, May sorry. Okay, yeah. very yeah. good. Nice. So sorry ladies. And a few of you guys out there, <laughs> Lars is taken. And I just had a birthday last week. There you go. So no, it's been a, it's been a great month. January is awesome so far. End of January year. Excellent. Probably beginning of February. Yeah? Yeah. Well, let's talk about what's going on in the world of video and stills. I, I want to address the black and white issue. Oh yeah, you were in the, tell us about the camera. Talk about the black and white. Okay, so... We have a new camera coming out from Arri. It's the uh, Arri. It's an Arri Alexa, so it's a very familiar camera to us. But it is a monochrome sensor, so it is black and white. So it boasts 15 stops, so you get an extra stop of latitude um, with the sensor. So you don't have to go through some of the pixels and or the color pixels. So yes, you get a little bit more information, and and yes, it's supposed to be stunning black and white. But my question is, is there really a market for a camera like this? How much is it? It's the same price as, a, as an Arri Alexa. I think, I think it's about the $75,000, $80,000 price range. So if you take those two and put them next to each other, black and white from the, the monochromatic camera and black and white from the regular camera, can you tell that much difference? I mean, is it that stunning? I don't think so. I don't think it is. I mean, I, I feel like you could take the Arri Alexa sensor or camera, or like the, the normal one that everybody uses and loves and trusts, lower the saturation, maybe bump the contrast a little bit, and still get that same image, or pretty close to it. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I'm not really sure if there's, if there's much of a market for a monochrome. It seems like a really specific, yeah, what if you're on set and you're going, I mean, just so nailed in the corner, you know? There's just no option. Yeah. I don't know. It seems strange to me. It seems like a very expensive toy. Well, here's, and here's the, the funny thing. We've got uh, a movie that's nominated for Best Cinematography this year in the Academy Awards um, that was shot black and white in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. uh, it was shot on the area Alexa in color because uh, the studio, I think, didn't want to have the option. They wanted to have the option in, in post-production of either showing it in color or black and white. They didn't really trust the director or cinematographer. And well, there's a great example. Yeah, yeah They exactly. wanted to do it in black and white, but the studios are going, no, 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 wait a minute. You shoot it in color, and then we can mess with it so we have the option if we just hate it when we're done. Yeah, and they, uh, they shot it in color, and they ended up using it black and white. And, and cinematically, it's nominated for an Academy Award. I personally don't see why, uh, but there it is. It's in the Academy Awards. So what's better in the Academy Awards this year? What do you think is a better uh, for cinematography? I know what you think because yeah. I feel very similar. I, I think gravity. And, and here's the reason why. And I think a lot of people are going to be, you know, there's, there was the Life of Pi upset last year. And, but here's my thought about the matter. Life of Pi, I kind of was upset about that too because it was really just one light that kind of moved around the whole set. And... Uh, it was really the post-production, the visual yeah. effects that made that movie stunning. Yeah, but it's a visual effects film. The gravity, the integration between the real world and that digital world was so seamless and so well thought out and executed that in my mind, cinematically, they achieved more than, than any other film, I think, this year. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, the very, I heard the director speak at, at DGA and he's going, you know, the issue was, is I didn't want to make a CGI film. I didn't want to make a film that's all about, you know, post effects. He said, I want it to be a journey. And in the journey, there's all these effects. But it's not an action film. It's her journey. Yeah. And in the end, you know, the action is just that reinforces her journey. It's what she has to get through to get to the end. And so it's a much different. So they would do long CGI pieces that most CGI houses are going, no, no, we do a plate. You know, we do a scene. And we go to the next scene. No, he's wanting these things to span through several, and they're just, the CGI places are going, my word, we're just not used to working that way. But uh, I think it was an amazing piece of work. So, uh, so do I. I think, I think everything about it cinematically. Yeah. I, I even like the script. That was the one complaint I heard most from everybody was that the script was boring. And, and I'm going, what? No, it's, it's, I thought it was a phenomenal piece of uh, cinema. Yeah. I, it was on last night again at our house, and it's uh, Third time I've seen it, and I just walking through as they were watching it, and I'm going, just the fact that there's no sound, all the explosions and everything, you know, there's no sound. I just, I love the way it was done, the way it was handled, but it just felt yeah. so right. 
I don't know. I love the film. Yeah. But. So, but but back to this monochrome. Okay. You know, so so Red uh, a year or two ago announced their monochrome Epic camera. Uh, had a base ISO of 2000, um, which is the same as this new Airy camera. So there, I feel like Airy was in a way almost kind of following Red's footsteps hmm. here a little bit, which didn't really make they, any they sense. They feel like to they me. have to have one because Red does. Yeah, and you know, three of the I think five films that were nominated for cinematography were shot on the Alexa. None of them were shot on the Red. Yeah. Like they've got nothing. They don't have to. Yeah, there's nothing to prove. Yeah. And, but, so I don't know, maybe there is a market. Is there a market? That'd be interesting to hear. If you have thoughts about this, if there's a market, let us know because it just seems interesting to us. We're not really sure where that market is or what the purpose is. So, yeah. so in the photography world, the camera everyone's talking about is the new Fuji X-T1. You know, I personally have a hard time getting very excited about these kinds of cameras, uh, but there is, there are some very interesting uh, kind of things that go on with this camera that I think are really interesting. The reason I love these types of things and I love these kinds of cameras is, I just said I'm not that interested in them, but the reason I do like them is I feel like they push the bigger manufacturers to get off their duffs sometimes and to get some of these features on other cameras. And we see that in this case, like they've got a screen in screen, so you can be able to have your framing, you're looking on the back, but you've got a screen in screen that's magnified to be able to pull your focus to. Uh, those kinds of features are really amazing. So this has a lot of really interesting features. It's, it's really made to be weather, weather, weather proof. I mean, down to like 20 below or 18 below or something. So they've taken all the buttons away that are gonna let moisture leak in. They've done everything they need to to be able to make this thing extremely weather tight so you can shoot outside in just really harsh weather. But the problem is it's not a full frame sensor. And so you're going, I, I'm not sure why anyone's in, investing money in the professional market. If they wanna be in the professional market, I'm not sure why they're spending money on a camera that isn't full frame, so. Well, I mean, because we got uh, Panasonic, too, that's making micro four, four thirds cameras, and they're very popular, especially in the video world. Uh, kind of like this Black Magic, the micro four thirds. So this, I'm wondering, you know, more and more, it seems like we kind of, we did this inverse triangle thing, where we, we kind of started on these, th with the digital world, these large, or small sensors, then we went to full frame, and now I kind of feel like we're going back to the small sensor a little bit. Yeah. So what do, you th what do you think? I mean, because I, I shoot full frame, you shoot full frame, and I, I really enjoy the color and depth of field that I get, but, um, but I'm almost wondering what the advantage is of like a micro four third sensor. <laughs> so we had to take a little quick break there because we're shooting today with all homemade soft boxes. We've got a soft box made out of a laundry detergent bucket. We've got a soft box made out of a styrofoam cooler and a soft box made out of a banker's box turned inside out. And it's all cool and fun and the light looks pretty decent, but they're melting down as we, uh, as we talk here because they've been on for longer than five or ten minutes. So. And so. I think right there is a wonderful lesson in the value of actually purchasing equipment yeah, it's fine. <laughs> that's built from actually this. Actually buy a light. If you're, if you're oh. going to use it, you probably should buy a light. <laughs> but if you're not going to use it, you can make one. It's going to work out fine. <laughs> so. Anyway, but it is kind of fun. We made these three soft boxes as part of our lesson called Creating a Home Studio. And it was just fun to put them to work and see how they worked out. But so anyway, pushing on, I, I, back to the sensor thing. You don't get the shallow depth of field again, right? You get half the shallow depth of field. So a 25 millimeter lens on your full frame is going to appear like a 50 on a micro four third sensor. Um, and some people see, are I'm okay in love with that. that. I'm yeah. in love with that. Yeah, you me know, too. I'm just in love with that and that the, the soft focus. Yeah, yeah. yeah it just it's hard for that. It's too cinematic. It's just it's hard to not have that look. It's hard not to go down that road. I agree. But I agree. I, it's it's everyone is in love right now. I think with with small. They're fighting small. The reason we're fighting small is because of iPhones. Yeah. Everyone's got a phone in their pocket that takes pictures, and so they're going. I don't want to carry a big DSLR. You know, I don't want to carry even the. The mirrorless cameras, you know, that have come out, they don't even want to carry that. So I think everyone's fighting that thought. How do we make cameras smaller and smaller and smaller so people will carry them and we can get a market again? So I think that's kind of the problem. Yeah, yeah, it is. So maybe with that thought, we should introduce this other item that we, uh, I got this week. I'll grab it here. This is made by a company called The Padcaster. And you've probably seen this on Apple ads and what have you, but it's basically your iPad. I'll turn this on. Your iPad uh, as a video camera setup. And so 
it's really a pretty amazing little setup. You've got sound through a jack that you use on a, as a, a guitar pickup. You've got hot shoes you can place on here, several of them. You've got corner 20 as far, and also 3.8s. So you've got different places to attach things. You've got a lens attachment so you can get a little wider lens you know, with a Vivitar attachment. And you know, for a pick this up and let's do an interview, set it up on a tripod, somebody with a microphone. I mean, these are just a really great, I think, I know as ridiculous as this sound, and I was making fun of people who take pictures with iPads a little while yeah, ago. Me too. I still do. I know, me too. <laughs> it's like, isn't that big enough for you? It's like, <laughs> but it's a matter of, I think this is where a lot of cameras are going to go. So rather than a small screen, small thing to look through, you think it's just going to be a big screen? Bigger screens, <laughs> uh, more integrated into devices that we're using, that we're used to using you know, that this becomes something that we've already got our hands on. That's why all the lenses that are coming out these days, I mean, everyone's got them, Schneider and I mean, all kinds of companies that are making them. But I, I think this goes beyond mirrorless. I think this goes into a total digital interface, and I think that's where cameras are going to go. Yeah. <laughs> so I think this is a great, I don't know, we'll have to play with it and use it a little bit and see how it works, and we'll post some footage of it. I'm just curious. I'm, you know, the, I, I did pick it up and kind of walk around with it a little bit, and... And I, it, it felt more stable than just picking up a camera and walking around with it. And is it just the, the actual space and the weight on that? Or? I think it's partly the weight because yeah. it's, it's got weight in your hands so you feel some bulk to it. It's not a very light piece of gear and I think they did that intentionally so that you could get some of that shake out and get a steadier mm -hmm. shot if you wanted to. Well, you're talking about the five, your new iPhone has incredible image stabilization. That's, yeah, it does, it does, yeah. So I just see this integration of this world I mean, for a blogger, this is an incredible setup. You throw it on a tripod, you shoot it, yeah. you Wi-Fi it, you post it, you're off and good to go. Yeah. I mean, you could probably edit it. You can edit it on here, can't you? Yeah, you can. Absolutely. You have iMovie on your, on your yeah. iPad or iPhone. So you can edit it and post it, and you're good to go. So it's a single device starts to solve all kinds of problems for us. Do they, I wonder, do they make a mold or an adapter for you to take like an iPad fitting and put your iPhone in it so that you can stick an iPhone in there as well and walk around? Something to think about. Hmm. That is interesting. Yeah. You'd have, it but it's got uh, the holes. You'd have to have it. Well, you could do that though. Yeah. So you could just choose whichever one you've got. Or yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, because I, you know, I sometimes I don't know if I've got this big thing and all my attachments and I got my iPhone in my pocket. I always know I got that. Mm. Just throw it in there, clip it in, and go. Yeah. I think this kind of transcends this. This kind of is more deliberate. You're you're going out to shoot something, and you're using this. Yeah. Good grief, we're making homemade softboxes today because people <laughs> complain about the cost of a softbox, you know, which reality is I feel like, you know, if you're in the industry, you need to commit yourself to one, the business of the industry, which yeah. means you've got to start making money and, and charging for what you do and then use a portion of that money to get the right equipment to do what you need to do. It's just the way the business is. Um, I understand you're a student and struggling, that's one world, but when you're when you're out and you're in the world, you know, start to work and start to get the equipment you need to. But yeah, I still get made fun of for the Lars cam or the Lars rig. <laughs> That's true. Uh, in case you haven't seen yeah. it, I, I built a shoulder rig uh, that made out of PVC and conduit, and I, I walk around with my DSLRs on that. Sometimes even C three hundreds or C one hundreds, and I and I get made fun of constantly. But it works, and, you know. So there there is that battle of you know well, what looks yeah. good and professional and what works really well for you. So, I, you know, I, I would never show up to shoot a, a CEO of a bank with a laundry detergent softbox. <laughs> yeah. Somehow that just doesn't go over well. Even if it looked better, I wouldn't do it. Even if you painted it. Yeah. yeah. Well, one, they fall apart. Ours are falling <laughs> apart right here. So you're going to spend a bunch of time making them work. You'd be better off to spend your time getting clients and trying to make your business grow than spending all your time trying to build equipment. And then when you get the money, you can buy the equipment you need. So how about those Micro Four Thirds? <laughs> That was a great way to jump back into the Micro Four Thirds. You know, there, there is one camera from Panasonic coming out. They had their GH3 camera became very popular in the video world, um, which was surprising. Micro Four Thirds, uh, 1080 image. Um, but they've got a new camera coming out uh, actually this month in February um, called the GH4K, I believe. And 4K. 4K. There you go. There's, there's the uh, magic word for yeah. 2014, right? Absolutely. That's what we said. 4K. 2001 4K, I think is how... There's, there's a joke in there somewhere. I'm not, I'm not quite <laughs> getting it right now, but uh, somewhere in there. Anyway, yeah, so it's a 4K DSLR kind of a Micro Four Thirds camera. Um, 
and it's supposed to have a price tag of under $2,000. So that will be the cheapest. For 4K? Mm -hmm. Cheapest interchangeable 4K. But uh, micro two thirds sensor. Four thirds. Yeah. Micro four thirds center sensor. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Boy, it'd be nice to get something, even in the $5,000 range that was 4K. Yeah, with a, so with a like a super a full, 35. Yeah, yeah, super, yeah, with a full sensor, something, yeah. It'd be interesting, but. Yeah, because you got the 1DC, which is, I mean, we shot with that camera. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a beautiful camera. Beautiful I think camera. I think the video looked awesome, and the stills look incredible as well, of course, but at $12,000, it's just, you know, you, you lose your market, your price point at that yeah. point. Although I'd love to have that camera, there's no doubt about it. Well, yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Canon, send us a camera. I know, man. right? I'm about ready to buy two of their C100s. Yeah, you've been hot on the C100. I have, for whatever reason, I've just been thinking about it, and there's for because I'm doing I'm doing a couple of feature documentaries this year, and uh, that's both both of them came to me and said, you know, we want this kind of style, we want this look, and and we're what camera do you think? And for both situations, it was like, oh yeah, the C100. Why is that? What is it? What's happening there that makes you feel like that is better than the Mark III? Um, well, first of all, you've got your built-in ND filters. Yeah. Huge. So, you know, I'm going indoor, outdoor, indoor, outdoor, and I'm running back and forth, and they're, you know, get this shot. We want shallow depth of field, of course. That's, that's the thing, cinematic these days. Everybody wants it. And, uh, and uh, more and more documentaries are getting that look. Um, so you've got those right built into the camera. How many uh, stops? One? You've got a two, four and a six, I think. Mm -hmm. Two, four and a six, I could be wrong. Okay. Um, if you know, go ahead and post in the comments. We'll hear about it, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. And uh, you built in XLRs. Um, yeah. And yeah, there's, what else about the camera? You know, it's very efficient. It records to an AVCHD codec, um, which unlike H.264 is, is just a really, really comprehensive, efficient codec. So you can actually, with a 64 gig card, you can record for something like four or five hours. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it still looks great, and that's the thing, uh, when, you, when you bring it into post. So as it looks, at, you're talking about the same sensor size as the Mark III? No, uh, no. it is a crop sensor, so Super 35. So Super 35. For any kind of cinema camera, that's about as big as you're gonna get, unless yeah. it's the Red Epic, which is a 1.3. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, 1.6 crop factor, uh, Super 35, and um, very low, lo uh, low noise, in, in low light situations, um, higher dynamic range, and the skin tones look, I mean, they're so sharp and so accurate that it's, it, it makes the camera pretty, pretty valuable. So does it blow away the 1DC 4K? No, it doesn't blow it away. It doesn't There's blow no it away. There's no way it blows it away, but mm -mm. it's just the application is easier. It's more of a cinematic camera. It is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, boy, that's a hard decision. Well, money-wise, doesn't make it that hard. Twelve yeah, thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, twelve, five, twelve. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and these documentaries, they want to do, of course, two camera setups. Sure. And so you can get two of those for ten thousand, and which isn't a small chunk of change. But when you're doing feature documentaries and you want this kind of look, and you're a running gun, and uh, there's the equipment rental, you know, and it's just it, it makes it worth it. Yeah, a producer buddy of mine, he he buys them and rents them back to the productions all the time. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. just the way to go. So. All right, well, there's a thought, a couple of thoughts about the, the cameras that are out on the market and what's coming up. But we have a surprise today. I'm going to unwrap the new Tamron 150 to 600 millimeter lens that they just sent us. And so. 150 to 600? <laughs> that's what, 150 to 600. <laughs> well, it has applications. 150 to 600 millimeters? I mean, you're really talking more uh, outdoor sport, not sports, but outdoor. Um, Wildlife mm -hmm. or those kinds of things. I guess sports as well. It is a, an f5.63 lens, so it's not a fast lens. It's not the, the format at all. But but uh, does it have any kind of image stabilization built in? Oh, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. <laughs> so let's see what we got. <laughs> it's it's huge. Okay. So this is uh, kind of contrary to the small camera idea. We go, whoa, what is the filter size on this thing? I have no idea. What is it? I don't know. It's got to. It's got to be in the. Oh, let me get my fingers out of there. One hundred five range. Well, you got to have room for all that glass. Oh my goodness. There, it's on there. I can't see all my glasses on. Ninety-five. Ninety-five. Ninety-five millimeter uh, uh, filter size there, and. <laughs> <laughs> 
There's just something scary about that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we have a shot on this. It's just Let's, out of the box. I want to shoot. We're going to run outside. We're going to shoot a few frames, and we're going to just see how it feels. We'll come back and give you a report. So Put on a full frame we'll be sensor? right back. Yeah, absolutely on a full frame sensor. Okay, yeah. yeah, I mean, shoot a portrait at, yeah. like, at 1,000 yards. <laughs> we can shoot that portrait at 1,000 yards. Let's do it. I want to shoot at this thing. Well, that, that was fun. We, we did just go outside right now, put this on a camera, and played around with it. That's pretty amazing. I mean, it doesn't focus super close. It's like an eight foot. Was like eight point nine feet. Eight point nine feet, so like nine feet, just about. Uh, but what a range! My word, it's amazing. And things fall pretty fast out of focus when you're at that distance. There's no doubt Even about at it. Six point three. Yeah, I mean, look at that. <laughs> it does have vibration control, which is the same as image stabilization. Got the autofocus. The autofocus was pretty fast. It was fast. Yeah, I was, was really surprised. Fast. The elements move right along. So, and I, I mean, I just was looking at the images on the back of the camera. It seems sharp. It seems yeah. like a, a really sharp lens. Yeah, absolutely. Even at 600 millimeters. Yeah. Yeah, even at 600 millimeters, and and yeah, no, it looks great. So, yeah, this will be fun. We'll play around with this uh, Tamron. This just came out. I think they're just hitting the market right now. So, anyway, check it out. It's a 150 to 600 millimeter lens. Write in and tell us when and why would you use this. It'd be interesting to hear from you. You know, what kind of application would you find for this? Obviously, you can look at some sporting applications. You can look at outdoor uh, animals, but just let us know when and how would you use that. It'd be interested to talk about. It, so. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mentioned the shoot up in Oregon. I actually, I took a 300 millimeter lens thinking it would be long enough. No. And uh, it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't long enough. There was that. Well, there was there was a, a, sp a particular spot where the actress wanted to. She was on a bridge over a waterfall, and I was probably a hundred yards away, and and she wanted just a nice close up. Mm. Maybe not quite a hundred yards, but you know about seventy yeah, yards. Yeah. And I and I couldn't give it to her. I, it was a it was pretty much a full. Yeah. I yeah, mean that just the distance. So you needed a six hundred millimeter. I would have needed a six hundred millimeter lens. There you go. It would have been perfect actually. Yeah. So. All right, well, another great piece of equipment from Tamron. But anyway, other things that we've uh, seen in the news that are interesting to us? H5? I got nothing. H5 was kind of fun. H5? Yeah. The, oh, yeah, talking about the new Zoom recorder, yeah. Zoom recorder, H5. So Zoom came out, they had the H4n, then they came out with the H6. And H6 was much bigger, had interchangeable lens, or, uh, lenses, yeah, interchangeable, interchangeable lenses. microphones, <laughs> um, and it had four XLR inputs. Really cool piece of gear. I ended up going with the Tascam because, to be completely honest, B&H was having a wonderful sale on it, and uh, it, came, it came with polarized software too. <laughs> so I said, well, okay, sorry, Zoom, I'm going with this guy. And uh, you know what? I love it. I, I love the Tascam. The Tascam. It's, oh, it's great. It's really great. Um, it didn't have the four XLR inputs. It had two. That was fine for me, for most applications, yeah. that's perfect. Um, but the new H5 that Zoom's coming out with is very familiar size-wise to the H4n. Uh, same kind of fits in your palm configuration. Um, it still has the interchangeable, inter interchangeable microphones, uh, two XLRs, but it did integrate some of the really important features like um, uh, a 20 dB pad right, right there on the unit, which is you just need it uh, in, in most applications. So yeah. talk about what a 20 dB pad is. 20 decibels. Mm -hmm. So you have two different types of inputs. You've got mic and line inputs. Mic inputs uh, come in pretty low. Um, and line inputs come in very hot. And so it's about 20 decibels louder. Uh, so you just need to flip that switch, cuts it pretty dramatically. So you can, if you're pulling sound out of a DJ, you can plug it into one channel and cut that channel 20 decibels. And if you've got a wireless microphone lob on somebody else, you can just bring that in at normal volume and, uh, and you'll be covered. It's got knobs to adjust the... Uh... Yes, actual knobs, actual levers to adjust volume yeah. control on each channel, which drove me crazy on the previous unit, you know, trying to get into menus frantically when you, you know, you're, you're starting and your, thing, your event is happening and you're trying to get levels and stuff set. Yeah. That was, that was painkiller. Um, so you don't have to press on the, uh, you know, which channel you're on. It's just got the knob for each channel. Knob for each channel. And um, I think it's got phantom power levers and uh, right, right there on the unit as well. Well, so. I'll have to check it out. I haven't seen the new one. I haven't yeah. seen it. Price-wise, I think it's probably, they haven't announced the price, but I think it's probably going to fall within about the $300 price range. So it's not in the stores yet. It's on its way. Uh, it's on its way. Yeah, it's on okay. the stores. Yeah. Very good. So it looked cool. It looked yeah. Good. All right. I haven't seen any great commercials. I don't know why this crossed my mind, except for there's a new one about uh, the uh, engineers getting their wings for uh, Volkswagen. That was pretty cool. 
don't know if I saw that. You didn't one. see? Oh, it's fun. It's just cute. It's fun. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's All worth right. seeing. So this weekend, Super Bowl. Of course, when you see this segment, Super Bowl will have happened. And uh, all the great ads will be out there. So hopefully there's something interesting. Do you have a particular team that you're going for? For me? Yeah. Oh, definitely the uh, Broncos. Okay. Well, I'm going for Seahawks. Really? I am. Why would you do that? I don't know. I got a soft spot for Seattle. So, so can we, by the time we watch this. By the time we watch this. They'll have won. They will have won. So do you want to make a friendly wager? Sure. What do you got in mind? I don't know. Do you want to do cash or do you want to do something else? Oh, you're talking serious when you start saying cash. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> My money's on Seattle. I think they're going to take it. You do? I do. No, it's John Elway all the way. Okay. Broncos. Right. Okay. Well, I, maybe, maybe we'll just uh, have you guys post in the comments. Um, which one of us is an idiot? <laughs> yeah, which one of us is an idiot? <laughs> I'm trying to think of a, I'm trying to think of something we can do here. So there's there's something weird about knowing that this is going to be watched after the Super Bowl. I know there is something weird. Although it's going to come out right after the Super Bowl, right? Uh, so it should be up real soon. So, again, I think we're kind of in a bit of a mode here, a little quiet out there, waiting for uh, NAB and some of the things are going to happen real soon. But uh, I think we'll have a lot of great information to talk about after uh, the year gets underway a little bit. So. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, this has been Lars Lindstrom, J.P. Morgan. Trends from the trenches. So everyone, have a great week. Have a great month. Uh, we'll be back in uh, February. Uh, or is this in February? This is February. We'll be back in March. And so everyone just keep on going. Keep on clicking. We've got a lot of great stuff coming in the next few months. Our business coaching class comes up real soon, so get on our newsletter. It's at theslenderlens.com. Great information about photography, photographic lighting. We hope to make life easier for you to give you the information and the tools you need to be able to be successful in your business. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram and Twitter. We also have a brand new web page they just put up. A lot of great information there, easy to use. Go to theslenderlens.com. We're now posting all our videos first on theslenderlens.com before they hit YouTube. They'll be on there for about a week to two weeks before they come to YouTube. So if you want to see them first, go to theslenderlens.com. So keep those cameras rolling. Keep on clicking.